welcome to Homework Hotline, home of the Puzzle a Day giveaway. I'm Doris Johnson Humphrey, and I'm here for the math segment of Homework Hotline. Today I'm going to be working on some interest, an interest problem dealing with systems of equations and working with slope of a line. I'm Robert Vriesman, and I'm here also for the math segment. Today I'm going to be working with circles all kinds of circles. But before we get started, let's go to one of our exciting English teachers, Angela Hewlett Block. She's sitting over there at the telephones right now and we want to see what kind of calls are coming in. Angela? Thanks Robert. I'm Angela Hewlett Block and just listen to those phones. They're jammed right now, so please be patient. If you have an English call, call in and ask for me. Maybe we can do your problem live on the air. English comes on at 5, so stay tuned now for 30 minutes of math with Doris and Robert. Thank you, Angela. Remember, you can call in your questions simply by calling the following number. Now jot this down, please. It's 1-800-527-8839. That's 1-800-527-8839. Or just dial 1-800-LA-STUDY. The call is free. It doesn't cost anything. So there's no need to wait. Let's get started. Here's Doris. Thank you, Robert. Now for today's puzzle. It seems that our students have been answering our puzzle questions on the first or second clue. So today, watch out, the clues are going to be even harder today. And the student who calls in the correct answer will win a special prize. That's right, Doris. For the student with the correct answer, we have the travel edition of Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? This special version of the popular PBS game show can be played anywhere at any time. And the game includes 28 clue cards and instructions on how to play. Amaze your friends and improve your knowledge of people, places, and things with a travel version of Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. And be sure to watch Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego immediately following Homework Hotline on this station. And now, back to Doris on Homework Hotline. Today you're trying to find out the name of a person. I will give you one clue, the first clue. If you need more clues, Robert, Mario, and Angela will be giving out more clues later. Clue number one, I never went to college, but I did get my MA. Again, I never went to college, but I did get my MA. If you know the answer to this clue, call 1-800-LA-STUDY now. And now we're going to start our show today with a question that was called in by Ofsana. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah. Very good, thank you. Your question you called in, you're dealing with interest, right? Yes. Would you read the question for us? The question on the board? Yes, please. Okay. Joan wants to borrow $25,000 to start a record company. The friendly bank will lend her the money at 70% interest for four years. How much will she pay in interest? Okay, we're gonna be using a formula that we use when we're trying to find interest. And since interest is what we're trying to find, do you know what the rest of that formula is? I equals PRT. PRT, right. And do you know what those letters stand for? What is the P in our formula? Principal. Okay, so that's the principal. So what is that really, the what? The, the borrowed, the the money. borrowed money. It's going to be the money. And the R stands for our? Rate. Rate, and that's going to be a percentage. And the T stands for? Time. Time, okay. So in that formula, we're dealing with principal rate times time, which is the money times the percent of interest and the time involved. So let's go back to our problem and substitute in the values that we're going to need. Again, we're trying to find the interest. And what is the amount of money we're trying to borrow? $25,000. $25,000. OK. And we're going to multiply that by the rate, yes. which is? Uh, you have to move the decimal to the left. Okay. Which becomes 0.17. Okay, so what we did, we dropped our percent sign and we divided by 100 and moved the decimal point two places to the left. That gives us our 17 hundredths. And the amount of time that this money is going to be borrowed? Four. Four. For four years. So this becomes our problem 25,000 times 17 hundredths times four. Okay, let's multiply the 17 times the 25,000. Okay, you want to do the multiplication for us? Yes. Zero, 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 35, 
There's a three. Seventeen. Okay, and then we go one. Zero, 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 five, two. Okay. So that zero, gives us. Zero, five, twelve, four. Okay, and where do we put our decimal point? In between the last two zeros. Here? Yes. Okay, so we marked off our two places. So we end up, after we've multiplied the amount of money to be borrowed at the rate, we end up with four, two, five, zero, or 4,250, right? Yes. yes. Okay, that's what we got when we multiplied this. Now we have to multiply. So what we're saying, if you only borrowed this money for a year, this is how much money you would have to pay back, right, in interest. But you're going to borrow this money for four years, so we have to multiply that times four. Will you do the multiplication for us again, please? Four times zero, zero, 20. Here's a two, 10, 17. Okay, no decimals to mark off. So what we're saying, if this person, if Joan borrows $25,000 to start her record company, and the bank, Friendly Bank, I love that name, Friendly Bank, is charging 17% interest, and she wants to borrow this money for four years, how much interest is she paying? $17,000. $17,000. And just look at the difference. If you're going to borrow $25,000 and you're paying back $17,000, High interest rate, right? Yeah. So when you, when you hear people talk about interest rates being high or low, you see what happens with the high interest rate. You're almost paying back only in interest the amount of money that you borrowed. So after four years with this amount of interest on this amount of money, how much are you really paying back for the money you borrowed? How can you find that out? Let's add these two numbers, okay? So we add the amount of money that we want to borrow and the interest that we have to pay and add this for me. Zero, 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 twelve, five. Four? Four. So, if Joan borrows $25,000, how much does she have to pay back? $42,000. $42,000. That's a lot, isn't it? Yes. So sometimes it's best when you start a business to kind of save up your own money and have a little money so you don't have to pay back so much interest. So again, uh, Opsana was working with an interest problem, which we deal with this every day, common everyday things that occur. And sometimes it's good for you to know how to do it. So if you are borrowing money, you know how to compute to make sure you're getting the right information. Okay? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Oh, great. Okay. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> you were a great helper. You helped me a lot in going through your problem. Um, Thank you very Ms. much. Give Doris a round of applause. <laughs> oh, <Okay. laughs> Oh, no one's ever given me one. I'll give myself one. Okay. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> that was a surprise. Okay, let's move to a question that was called in by Samantha. And Samantha's a 10th grader, and w she was asked to find the point of intersection. She's given two linear equations, and to find the point of intersection, we have to find that ordered pair that satisfies both of these equations. So we're going to use the addition subtraction method because it's easier in this problem the way it's set up. We can solve for our x's and then we'll solve for the y. The reason that we can solve for x first, if I add the x's, the y's have already eliminated themselves and they also call this the elimination method, have already eliminated themselves so I can go right ahead and solve for x. So I can add my x terms and 7 plus 5 gives me 12. Dividing by 4. We have x equals 3, so I have a value for x. Now I can take the value for x and I can substitute it back into the top equation. And x now becomes 3, so now I have 3 plus y equals 7. I just substituted my x here. Then I can solve for y, so I can subtract 3 from both sides. That leaves me with y equals 4. So now I have an ordered pair. The value for x goes first and the value for y goes second. Now let's check it. 3 plus 4 equals 7, and that checks out, so the ordered pair works for the top equation. 3 times 3 is 9, minus 4 equals 5, and so the 3 and 4 solutions for x and y work here. So then this is the solution set, and this would be the point of intersection. So if we were to graph something like this, this would be the point where they would cross the lines, 3, 4. Next, move on to Sachin. I hope that's the way the name is pronounced. And here we're going to solve an equation for y in terms of x. First of all, I want to 
take the least common denominator, which is x plus y, which is the only denominator we have, and we're going to multiply each of the terms of this whole equation by x plus y. If we multiply 8 divided by x plus y by x plus y, you'll notice that the x plus y's cancel out here, leaving us with an 8. We also multiply 6 times x plus y, and that gives us 6 times the quantity x plus y. They didn't cancel because we didn't have a denominator to cancel them out. So now we're going to use our distributive property, and we have 8 equals, multiplying out 6x, also multiplied times the y, which gives us 6y. Remember, we were asked to solve this equation for y in terms of x. So with that in mind, I'm going to subtract 6x from both sides. We have negative 6x plus 8 equals 6y. Again, we're solving for y in terms of x, which means I'm going to divide each term by 6. Here, I end up with negative x plus 8 6, which can reduce to 4 thirds, equals y. Now, because I'm solving for y in terms of x, we can have negative x plus 4 thirds equals y. And we can change it around. We'll leave it in that direction. The next question was called in by a ninth grade student. And in this particular question, we're trying to find the slope. And to find the slope, we're going to use this formula. What? Where m represents the slope. And we have y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And that's the formula that we're going to be using. And these are the points that we have. The point is 9, 5, and 7, 6. Now, you probably wonder what this y2, y sub 1 is. Well, this is our first ordered pair, and this is our second ordered pair. We'll get our values for x and y out of here for x and y sub 1, and this would be for x and y sub 2. So m, which is representing our slope, we have the second value here, which is 6, minus the first y, which is 5, and that's going to be over the second x, which is 7, minus the first x, and the value for that is 9. So now that we've plugged in our values, we're going to simplify this. 6 minus 5 gives us negative 6 minus 5 gives us 1. 7 minus 9 gives us negative 2. So we say that m, which is our slope, is negative 1 half. And if we were to graph an equation with those points, we would find out that we would have a negative slope, which would be going down as we graph it. Next question that was called in by an eighth grader, Michael. In this particular question, we are simplifying an expression. Two times a plus five quantity squared. First of all, when we're doing the order of operation, and this applies here, we have to take care of our powers first. So before we multiply, we're going to take care of our powers, which means we're going to be expanding this binomial. And to expand the binomial, you look at your first term, and you square that term. So if we're squaring a, we have a squared. Look at your two terms together and multiply those two terms. So what we're looking at now, instead of a plus 5, we're saying 5 times a. So 5 times a, and we double that. 5 times a is 5a. We double that. We have 10a. And you use that sign between your, by your terms here. Then we look at the last term, and we square that last term. And that squared, 5 squared, is 25. So now that we've taken care of the powers and expanded that binomial, now we can do, use our distributive property and multiply. OK, so that would be the answer to that particular problem. Now that we've expanded the binomial and multiplied, the next question that was called in by a ninth grader, we're going in the opposite direction. We have x squared minus 25. And what we're going to do now is factor. So we have our square term, minus 25. If you notice this, this is the perfect square, 
and this is a perfect square, so this is the difference of squares. And we're going to factor this as two binomials. We take the square root of our first term, which is x, and we put it in each set of parentheses. We take the square root of 25, which is 5, plus, minus. So we went from this uh, difference of squares, and we factored it. And it's just the opposite operation that we handled there. One last question, a factoring question, x squared minus x minus 30. And we're going to factor this, OK? So we have an x and an x. Since it's not the difference of squares, we have to look at this last term here, which is the product of our two numbers. So we're looking for two numbers when multiplied will give us 30. And when added, will give us a difference of 1. So we have 6 and 5, because I know if I multiply 6 times 5, it's 30. And I know those two numbers differ by 1. Now, since we have our numbers, we need to see where we're going to put our negative and positive sign. And why do I know we need a negative and positive sign? Because the product is negative. It tells me I have to have one of my terms has to have a negative in it. So I'm going to put the negative here, because remember, the difference is going to be negative. And this would be my positive. In checking, negative 6x and a positive 5, that gives me that negative 1 that I need. And a negative 6 times a positive 5 gives me a negative 30. That's all the time for my math segment today, but Robert is standing by with 15 more minutes of math and a clue. That's right, Doris. Not only 15 more minutes of math, but another clue, and here it is. You might want to jot this down. It's not a very long clue, but this is it. I never heard of America. That's the clue. I never heard of America. Now, let me review Doris's clue here. I never went to college, but I did get my MA. I never went to college, but I did get my MA, and my clue was I never heard of America. So if you have some idea, give a call. The number is 1-800-LA-STUDY. All right, now, let's look at the board here. Oh, first of all, I want to introduce someone. Jenea, can you hear me? Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? Fine. Good. Thank you for calling Homework Hotline. Now, can you see all these circles on your own television mm -hmm. at home? Yes. All right. Now, we want to do several things with these circles, Jenea. First of all, we want, to, we want to tell everybody out there the formula for the area of a circle. Do you know what the formula for the area of a circle is? It's um, 5 times radius squared. That's exactly right. Let's write that down right over here. Area of a circle equals pi times the radius squared. Now, very quickly, I'm going to point to one of these circles. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to tell units, because I haven't put any units up here. But I just want you to tell me the, the area of the circle just by a quick glance, OK? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. Ready? Mm -hmm. OK, what's this one right here? 9 pi. 9 pi. And this one over here? I can't see it. All right, we need to switch cameras there. Here we go. Um, 25 pi. And this one here, the little one? 4 pi. All right, and this one over here? Um, 36 pi. And over here? 16 pi. Oh, uh, here's one that's sometimes tricky. One pi. One pi, or we could just say pi. pi. This circle has an area of pi. How about this one down here? It has a radius of r. Um, radius pi. Well, if it, it, it would be r squared pi, oh. OK? Because we have to square the radius, right? Yes. OK? So this, this, is, this is how we derive our formula from it. Now, how about this one, 3.5? Can you do that one real fast? Uh-uh. All right. Now remember, do you know a little trick for squaring a number that ends in a 5? Uh-uh. OK. Well, let me teach that trick real quick, all right? All right. All right. So um, we'll make a list of numbers that end in 5 here, all right? And so on, 65, 75. The trick works for all that, OK? Mm -hmm. What's the next number past 1? 2. 2. 1 times 2 is? 2. And then 5 times 5 is 25, so it's just 225. It's this number times the next one that follows it, and then it always ends in 25, OK? OK. Let's try this one now. What would this one be? Um, 625. That's exactly right, OK? So this one would be? Um, 1,225. Right, 1,225. So what would this be here? What would, I can't see it. OK, back down to this circle, Mr. Cameraman. <laughs> OK, are we there? Um, OK, it's 35. All you have to do is put the decimal right in there. So it would be? 12.25. Pi. Pi, exactly right. <laughs> OK, that's very good. All right, so I'm going to go through this quickly myself, just to remind everybody what it, what it was. This is 9 pi, 25 pi, 4 pi, 16 pi, 36 pi, 
pi, 12.25 pi, and pi r squared, or r squared pi, right? Mm -hmm. So with a little bit of practice, you can get really good at just looking at a circle where you know the radius and tell what the area is. Now, if we want, if we want it in terms of a decimal, all we'd have to do is multiply, for example, in this one, we'd have to multiply the 9 times an approximation for pi. And the real common approximation for pi is 3.14, correct? Right. All right. But these days with calculators, that's a quick calculator work. I mean, how many times do you have to multiply by 3.14, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Now, Janae, if you have the time, I'd like you to help me with this one, where we're going to utilize that formula a little bit more in depth, all right? OK. OK. Now, this one, this here says, in circle O below, AO, that's this distance right here, equals 15. So they're telling us that the radius is 15, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And the measure of angle AOB equals 72. Can you see this 72 right here? Yes. All right. Now, they first of all want us to find the measure of the arc AB. All right, if the central angle is 72, what's the measure of the arc? Do you know that? Uh, yes. What would it be? Um, it's going to be one. No. One. No, you're, I can tell you're thinking too hard. <laughs> See, you're confusing. I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to tell me what it would be if it was like this. Because you tried to double it, didn't you? Um, I don't know what I tried to do. Yeah, I think you were trying to double it. So if the central angle is 72, uh, the arc will also be... Oh, 72. Exactly right. Oh, okay. See, See, it's, it's quite simple. All right. Now, what you were trying to do, it, it sounded to me that you were trying to double it. OK, so if this angle right here is 72, well, I should draw a little bigger. Okay. I know, <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's slide back over here to this one, all right? All right, now, if we, have, if we have an inscribed angle as opposed to a central angle, and this is 72, I should have made it a little bigger, then what would this arc be? OK, that would be 144. That would be 144. Is that what you were trying to do before? No. Oh, just... sorry. OK. Now what we need to do is find this length. Now this is just a piece of the circumference, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We know what it is in terms of degrees, but we don't want to know what the degrees are now. We want to know the length of that. But first of all, could you tell me what formula will we use to find the whole length? I forgot. All right, it's not pi r squared. It's pi times the? Um, the not, um. That's it? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Oh, uh, come on. I'm going to make you think of it. Um, Pi uh, times the? Uh, I know it's not the, uh, I don't know. You almost have it. Say it a few times, you'll get it. Not denominator, but? Uh, but. It starts with a D. I don't know. Come on. Uh, uh, I don't know. OK, diameter. Oh, uh, see, I knew it. I, th I knew Give you knew it. You should have just said it. it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, circumference equals pi times the diameter, OK? Uh -huh. Now, if the radius is 15, the diameter must be? 30. Exactly. So we know that this diameter is 30. So we know the whole circumference is going to be 30, 30 pi, pi, right? Right. All right, we need space here, the final frontier. All right. Now, we don't need to know the whole circumference. We only need, only need to know the piece from A to B, don't we? Mm -hmm. What fraction of the whole circle is that piece from A to B? Now we have to use this, we have to use this again. How many degrees in a whole circle? 360. 360. All right, we'll put that right there. Now we don't want the whole circle. We only want how many degrees of that 360? 72. Right. We want 72 360 ths of that 30 pi. Right. Right. Now, this can reduce very nicely, okay? Mm-hmm. Or it's can you see how many times 72? Uh, uh, so I want you to go ahead. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's one fifth, all right? Uh -huh. All right, it's one fifth of 30 pi. Uh -huh. Now, what is one fifth of 30 pi? Uh, 150 pi? No. Here, put this over one. Five uh, was 50. Are you going to cancel it for me? Yeah, okay. sure. Six pi. Six pi. Okay, so that means that our arc AB, uh -huh. arc AB equals. 6 pi, all right? In other words, this distance from right here to right here is 6 pi. Uh -huh. Now, we weren't given any units, so we can just, if we have to label it, we would just put 6 pi units, OK? Uh -huh. Now, do I need to write squared or cubed or anything? No. No, because it's just a linear measure. It's just a line, uh -huh. all right? Right. Now, 
So we found the measure of AB. We said it was 72 degrees. That's the first thing. And we found the length of AB. That's 6 pi units. Now, what, what about if we wanted to find the area of that sector? Let's come back over here and look at all these little circles over here. We found the area of all these. And remember this little trick right here. What would be the area of this circle if the radius is 15? Um, 225? Um, 225 pi. pi. OK, yeah. 225 pi. Very good. That's very good. <laughs> so we'll write that right there, 225 pi. Now, we don't want to know the whole circle. We only want to know what fraction one of this? One fifth. So we'll put this in parentheses and we'll put one fifth in front of it like that. Mm. Now, how many times does five go into 225? 15? 45. Oh. Okay, good, good guess though. So the area of our sector would be 45 pi. 45 pi. And then in this case, it would be units squared. Square. Okay, very good, Janaya. That's excellent. Now, here's one other little question here to, just to kind of review everything we've talked about, okay? Uh huh. All right. This problem right here, let's say a circle has an area of 144 pi. Now, they're not asking us to find the area. They're telling us the area. And we're going to derive its radius, its diameter, and its circumference, OK? Mm -hmm. All right. So we know that the formula for area of a circle equals pi times the radius squared, right? But in this case, they tell us that the area is? 144 pi. So we'll write that there, since we know the area of the circle is 144 pi. Mm -hmm. And that's going to equal? The Five. formula, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if, if, uh, how, how would we proceed from here? Oh, I have to put yeah, the pi in this side. Yeah, you put the pi right there, so All we right. cancel the pies. Right, we cancel the pies. Okay, so we can divide both sides by pi. Right. These pies will cancel. So 144 is going to equal the r squared. So what is r going to equal? 72. Oh. What's what? the square root of 144? Not half oh. of it. Mm, I don't know. Yes, you do know this. What uh, times what is 144? 10. No. Uh, oh. Come on. Help me out, math teacher. <laughs> All right. 10 times 10 is 100. 11 times 11 is 121. And 12 times 12 is? 1. Something. 144. So the square oh, root of 144 yeah, would have that's to right. be. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You knew that, right? Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the radius of 12. Mm -hmm. If the radius is 12, what's the diameter? Um, 24. So the diameter would have to be 24. So 24 would equal the diameter. Now, remember the formula for circumference of a circle. Uh huh. Okay. So if the diameter is 24, the circumference of the circle must be. 24 pi. 24 pi. That's right. So 24 pi would equal the circumference. Jenea, you did an exceptional job. All right, let's have a, a, a round of applause for Jenea. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your help. Okay. Now go back and study those formulas again so you can get them just like that, okay? Okay. All right, thank Bye. you again, Jenea. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. All right, let's go back over these drawings one more time. So, so just, just for a little bit of practice here, because I think in something like this, the, the practice is necessary in order to get that that automaticity that's necessary. Again, everyone, every, I, want, I want to try this now. Everyone at home, call out the answer in your own living room right there, okay? So what would this one be right here? Right. And this one right here? Perfect. And this one, oh, I erased the, di uh, the radius there. So let's come down to this one. What would this one be? No, not 8 pi. Yes, right, 16 pi. It would be 16 pi. What would this one be here? Right, 36 pi. And this one would be here would just be plain pi. 1 squared is 1, 1 times pi is pi. All right, we're out of time. That's all the time we have for the math today. But don't go away, because English is coming right up.
Hi, welcome to the English segment of Homework Hotline. I'm Mario Suarez. And I'm Angela Hewlett-Block. What are you doing today, Mario? Well, we have lots of things ongoing, as they say. <laughs> but before we get into them, let me remind you that our teachers are here, ready to take your questions in math, English, social studies, and science. The number 1-800-LA-STUDY. Now, with apologies to the Scarlet Pimpernel, you see her here, you see her there, you see Carmen San Diego everywhere. There's no winner yet. You still have time to answer. And the clues are as follows. Number one, I never went to college, but I did get my M.A. And I never heard of America. And then I lived in Africa. Now. Get the correct answer and earn that These big surprise. Today. These are tough. Yes. Really That's tough. right, we Mario. Have, uh, we've had For the student with the correct answer, we have the travel edition of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? This special version of the popular PBS game show can be played anywhere at any time. The game includes 28 clue cards and instructions on how to play. Amaze your friends and improve your knowledge of people, places, and things with a travel version of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? And be sure to watch Where in the World is Carmen San Diego immediately following Homework Hotline on this station. And now back to Mario on Homework Hotline. Okay, I had a call from Albert, a ninth grader at Eagle Rock. Okay. Albert, right there. He plays the license plate game with his sisters and brother when the family travels on weekends. But he was stumped by this license plate on a white convertible VW Rabbit. Here's the one that stumps him. So look carefully at that. Now, the goal of the license plate game played while motoring used to be to spot cars from as many different states as possible. Now the goal is to spot and interpret as many uh, vanity license plates as possible. Vanity license plate, VLP. For instance, here we have this one, right here. Look at it carefully. LA, late again, late again. This one, peace for us. This one, very interesting. Ego examiner. A psychiatrist pushing six feet, someone who's intent on growing. Rock star, my goodness, a dream. And then, let's get back to this. Have you gotten it? I'm late, I'm late. And of course, that's a quotation from Alice in Wonderland. That's the white rabbit. And remember, that's from a VW white rabbit convertible, okay? Very appropriate. Now, traditionally, literature consists of poetry and prose. Today, modern living and the automobile have added a new game or form of literature, the personalized vanity license plate, the VLP I talked about. It's a very personal, very brief expression of a car owner. It's limited to seven spaces. That's as, that's as much space as you can get on that plate. It can be letters, it can be numbers, any combination thereof. And these highway haikus, what a beautiful expression that is. These highway haikus of a sort, we can call them folk tales. And of course, we have to spell that a special way, right? Folk tales. We can call them tailgating. Tailgating. And people are very creative. We now have, and to extend this a little bit further, we now have Daniel Nussbaum has written a book called, and that's the name of his book, from a license plate he saw. And that translates into plate speak, the language of these license plates. And the, he's written a book entirely composed of the license plates that he has seen. And in these license plates, 
he retells classic stories. For instance, he retells the classic story of Oedipus Rex, and he gets the title right here, Oedipus, from a license plate he saw. The king, Oedipus Rex, Rex meaning king. And now, let me see what he does with The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. This is a celebrated short story by Kafka, his most perfectly finished work. It begins with this famous opening. When Gregor Samsa woke up one morning from unsettling dreams, he found himself changed into a monstrous vermin. He was lying on his back as hard as armor plate, and when he lifted his head a little, he saw his vaulted brown belly sectioned by arch-shaped ribs to whose dome the cover, about to slide off completely, could barely cling. His many legs, pitifully thin compared with the size of the rest of him, were waving helplessly before his eyes. The story then proceeds to develop, to develop the effects of this change upon Gregor's job, his family life, and it ends finally with his death. It has been read as everything from religious allegory to psychoanalytic case history. It is notable for its clear description and attention to significant detail, which give its completely fantastic occurrences an aura of indisputable truth. Now, I'm going to take Nussbaum, Daniel Nussbaum's version of that story, which he developed from entirely from license plates. And here it is. Here is the article which, which appeared in the paper in which he gives you a recap of the metamorphosis. And remember, this is done entirely from license plates that he observed. Let's go through it carefully and see. First of all, his title, Bug Dude, and that stands for metamorphosis. And let's go through it. On the left, we have the license plates, and on the right, we have the translations. And let's see what he's done with this story. Gregor Samsa did go to sleep. One average guy, one average guy. See how clever that is. He wakes, he wakes up, a totally repulsive, hu humongous roach. Gregor's first thoughts, he has to boogie, dress up, eat fast, go to work. Gregor does not yet see that, see that a five foot, 10 inch cockroach is unwanted to the extreme. Outside the door, Greg's mom and dad fret. Are you ill in there? Can you say what it is? Hey, kiddo, come out. But bug boy can't come outside. Look at Greg struggle in bed. Stuck flip side up. Very, very frustrated. Skinny bug legs wave before his own bug face. Knock, knock. Make room for Greg's uptight, obnoxious, look at that obnoxious, obnoxious boss. Hey, Greg. You are too much, you are too much, says the boss. Tell me, why are you hiding out? Have you embezzled big bucks? Is that why? Confess, the bug says, and this is what the bug says right here. That's bug talk right there, bug talk. We don't have to translate that. More bug talk right here. 
Let me get that info. There it is. More bug talk right here. Again, we don't need to translate. The boss goes, excuse me. And look at how clever that is. Excuse me. No human voice can do that noise. Those noises can't be made by a human. Mom goes, he is sick. I tell you, go for the doctor. Go for doc. Pronto. Go get a locksmith. Weeks go by. Gregor lives locked up in his room. No one will visit. Not even. No one will visit. Not even. Mom. Mother. How lonely. How boring. Bugs rate very low. The grub stinks? Oh, sure. Our bug gets to go walk on his ceiling. But, his, but big deal. One day, Greg decides he hurts the family simply by being. The next day, the maid makes a discovery. The corpse of a bug dude. She goes, hey, lady, it's dead. Now Greg's family will breathe again, free of him, their son, a gross mega buck, mega bug, the end. And there it is, an entire summary of a classic short story, The Metamorphosis, by Kafka. And it's all done with these vanity license plates. These plates, these plates. This one, a quotation from a famous story, Alice in Wonderland. This one, which is really autobiographical. The motorist tells you something about himself. This one is a theme for the entire world, peace. This one details a person's career. This one a person's secret wish to be tall. This one, a dream to achieve something in music. And that's what vanity license plates are. They tell us an awful lot about the driver ahead of us, OK? And again, these, I call them highway haikus. A very short, a very brief form of literature that we have developed on our highways. My time is up, but let's see what Miss Angela has developed over here. Got a lot of things developing. No one has the answer yet. We'll find Carmen, you bet. Maybe this time you'll see clear through. I'll review the clues for you. Clue number one, did you figure out M-A? Clue number two, never heard of America, you say. Clue number three, living in Africa. From here, a long, long ride. And clue number four, my husband committed suicide. Okay, let me read them straight for you in case you missed it, but mixed up in my little poetry here. The first clue was, I never went to college, but I did get my MA. The second clue, I never heard of America. Clue number three, I live in Africa. And clue number four, my husband committed suicide. Okay, keep calling in. You guys have been doing a great uh, job trying to uh, come up with the answer for that. Okay, I have uh, lots of fun things to do today. We are going to work with words. And I have a caller today, correct? Yes. Hi, Amir, right? Yeah. Amir, what grade are you in? Fourth. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon? Fourth grade. Fourth grade, and you go to what school? Westminster Magnet. Great, Westminster Magnet. And Amir told me that uh, they have been working with synonyms in class, correct? Yes. All right, and what we're going to do here, Amir, is talk about synonyms, and then I'm going to have you give me uh, another word to fit in these little phrases, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, let me talk about synonyms and define them. Synonyms are words that are close to each other in meaning. For example, if we have the word break, look at all of these words we could substitute in a sentence for the word break. Now, one thing we need to remember when we're using synonyms, 
the, the meanings aren't exactly the same. A, a, a different word may give a different suggestion, okay? And we'll talk more about that later. So smash, crash, crush, shatter, crack, split, fracture, splinter. Okay, can you see all of those? Yeah. Amir? Okay, great. Now what I'd like you to help me with down here is look at the word that I have written in red yeah. and substitute a synonym for me. If you can come up with another word that would um, be close to the same meaning. A quick walk. What, can, what would you substitute there? Uh, a hurry walk. Good, hurried. Can you give me another one? Uh, a fast walk. Very good, fast. All right, let's look at number two, a strange dream. Have you ever had one of those? Yeah. All right, then give me another word to describe that dream. Um, a weird dream. Good. Oops, excuse my spelling. Okay, and give me another one for strange. Um, uh, unusual dream. Excellent. Right. A cute smile. Uh, a pretty smile. Thank you. Very good. Very good. And one more. Uh, beautiful smile. Okay. Right. Number four, a great show like Homework Hotline. A great show. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful, yes. Wonderful. And can you think of another? Uh, a nice show. A nice show. All right. We'll take that. A big shark. Huge. Huge. Or what else, possibly? Humongous. Okay. All right. A quiet spot. Um. Quiet. quiet uh, now, even if it doesn't mean, this is uh, where we uh, get into what I was talking about earlier. Even if it doesn't mean absolutely silent, it might be something else that suggests a um, uh, you know, a place that's quiet, um, a place where you might want to go, you know, to be by yourself for a while. A okay. silent spot? Silent spot. Okay, that works. Or, what else? Um, uh, a whispering spot? A whispering spot. Maybe uh, a whispering spot if you're somewhere near um, a stream or a brook. Yeah. Or, or maybe if you just hear the, the rattle of the wind in the trees. Yeah. That could be a whispering spot. Good. A good time, like you're having right now. Uh, great. Great. One that, give me another one that really, really creates a, a picture for us of this, of this great time that you're having. A wonderful time. <laughs> okay. Good. A bad job. Definitely not what you're doing today, Amir. You're doing a great job, but a bad job. Um, not good. Well, would you say you did a not good job? Uh, you what's did another, what's a, a, another way of saying bad? You did a terrible. Okay. Terrible. Can you give me one more? Mm. Uh. If you um, uh, think of uh, maybe something that you, you did, maybe that you didn't do so well at. And if, you know, it might, might not sound so nice if someone said, you know, Amir, you did a bad job. What else could someone say, okay, to you? That wouldn't sound, we call those uh, pseudonyms. What's another word that doesn't sound as harsh as bad? Can you think of one? Okay, you know, we can come back to it. If you think of one, then we'll go back, all right? I don't want to put you on the spot there. A happy person. Uh, um, uh. <laughs> no. Oh. 
a happy person, a think of a person who's uh, you know maybe having a birthday, something um, someone who's having a good time. A wonderful person. Well, the person that tells me more about um, uh, about the type of person maybe rather than how the person is feeling. That's what we're looking for. Something else to describe this feeling of happiness. Let me put one here to help you out. Does this work? Oh yes. Joyful. Um. Well, you know what, Amir, I don't want to. I don't want to pr press you because you've done an excellent job, and and for a fourth grader, I really want to say you have come up with with quite a list of words here. You've got a very good vocabulary. I bet you're a good student. Yeah. Okay, I could tell. Amir, you deserve a great round of applause, and let's give him one. Thank you, Amir. And will you help me again soon? Yes. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was really great. Um, it's it's uh, exciting when we get uh, the younger students on the TV show, and I'm, I'm very impressed with the kinds of words that he was able to come up with. I want to uh, move on and talk more about words and talk about the many meanings of words. One word could be used, for example, several different ways. Let's take a look at this sentence. My car's body is rusty, but the frame is solid. The word we want to work with in these sentences is frame. In this instance, frame means the actual outline or the, the body of the car, okay, or the, or the main part that holds the car together. Frame, okay? Now, look at sentence number two. She has bold a strike in every frame. Now, notice how the meaning changes here. We're talking uh, about the actual game of bowling and within that frame, that particular turn of hers, all right? In every frame. This picture, look at number three, this picture would look best in a wooden frame. I bet you didn't realize that a simple word like frame could have so many different meanings, right? So here we're talking about the actual frame that would go in a picture, okay? Uh, and number four. I think I'll get metal frames for my next pair of glasses. Notice this. We're talking about, a diff an, a, again, an outline or, or an outlining of something or a border, but a frame of a different sort, a frame for glasses. And here we have one very simple word, frame, used four different ways. And I'm sure that we could uh, probably come up with many, many more ways that frame could be used. Um, we have not uh, gotten a winner yet, or uh, if we have, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But what I'm going to do now is give you one more hint uh, so that we can uh, have a winner before the show ends. Um, the final clue for today is, I was the last to rule Egypt before it was declared a Roman province. Okay. I was the last to rule Egypt before it was declared a Roman province. Okay, so hopefully someone will uh, get the answer. We're counting on you to do it this time. I have uh, a couple of cartoons I want to show you over here. And these are uh, cartoons that I found in the, uh, the comics, everyday comic strip. And there's a particular one um, called Word for Word where they talk about the usage of a word and how uh, the original meaning and how the word has changed over the years. If we can take a look at this one, let's t look at the word partner. Okay, let me read the cartoon for you. Today, partner can be used in many ways, but once it had a specific meaning. And the specific meaning here, the word is from the 13th century parsoner which meant a joint heir to a will, all right? We have a winner, yay! Okay, is, uh, do we have a winner on the line? Not yet? Okay, um, our winner is Bobby, a 12th grade student at Alamany High School, okay? Uh, Bobby, uh, someone is getting your number now and we will be in touch with you shortly, okay? So Bobby, um, you know, stay in, in touch with us and we'll be 
there with you soon, okay? All right, let me get back to the word. Congratulations again, Bobby, and we'll hold, hold on to that. The oh, the answer is, sorry, the answer is Cleopatra. And I believe that last clue of mine uh, gave it away. So that was fantastic. We had a lot of callers trying to get that one. So congratulations, Bobby. Someone will be calling you, okay? All right. Um, let me uh, talk more about the word partner. Let's take a look at a few sentences that I have here. All right, look at sentence number one. An associate or colleague as in a business. Okay. Robert and his brother Steve have become partners in the stock business. All right, and notice how we have the word uh, uh, partners here used a little bit differently or somewhat similar to that original meaning of the joint heir to a will. Number two, either of a couple who dance together, all right? So we, you might have partners in a dance. The music is starting, said Malika. Let's find partners so we can dance, all right? And um, uh, many people today um, are filled with the music and they don't wait for partners. They get up and dance alone, which is great. Or a partner can be a husband or wife. Joan said, my husband and I have been partners for 30 years. Okay, so we have several meanings of the word uh, partner here. Uh, let me take a look at one more very quickly. I have uh, less than a minute. And let's take a look at the word grazing. We can look at this cartoon of Broomhilda. Okay. Grazing? I never thought of it as grazing, she says. But I'll give the idea serious consideration as I move on to the raspberry ripple. So what is she doing? It looks as if she's behind the counter tasting all of the ice cream, something I would uh, like to do uh, this evening. So she's getting a little taste of each one, and that's called grazing, all right? Um, I believe I am just about out of time. It's, um, it's important for you to be sure that you pay attention closely to words and, and their context, and um, be sure that you're understanding what the meaning of the word is used in a particular sentence or a particular story, because it can change and they take on lots of different meanings. We had a great time today. We are very excited that you joined in and called us. Tune in tomorrow for more of Homework Hotline. Bye-bye.